All right. How's everybody doing this morning? We're here. Yeah, we're live. It's all good news. All right. Hey. Okay. So, um, all right. So today we're going to start with a review of motors. Um, so, um, we talked a little bit about motors last time. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how they work again. And then, um, we'll look at two commands that we used to control servo motors. So we used the pulse out command to send those messages to the servo motors to tell them how fast to turn and which direction they should turn in. And then we also used the for next loop to um, send those commands and tell it how long those motors should rotate. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Can I switch partners? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So um, and then for lecture, we'll go on and we will um, we'll talk about Bobots. So this is a really exciting class because um, today we actually get to build your your robots and make them follow the course on the floor. So the idea is that they're supposed to be driving through a warehouse and they need to uh, navigate along on the floor and follow this path through the warehouse and then park themselves in the parking spot at the end. So, um, so we'll talk about how we're going to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the goal for the day and then um, we'll go on and do a preview of today's lab. So you can see that the lecture is really not going to be very long. I want to give you guys as much time as possible to work on these because it takes a little while to assemble them and then the programming can be a little bit uh, finicky sometimes. Um, but we will we'll actually have two days to work on these robots. So we'll work on them today and then also next time. So, um, so you don't have to rush through it. Um, definitely take your time and, and um, make sure you understand how this works, okay? So for the lab preview, we'll talk about how to actually assemble the robots and put them together. We'll talk about how you can test your robot after it's been assembled. And then, um, just like before, we're not gonna make you write this program from scratch. We're gonna give you a program to start with, but that program is gonna have some bugs in it. It's not gonna work perfectly. Um, and there might even be some parts that you have to add to the program, okay? So it'll be a starting point, but it's, it's not going to be the finished product, okay? So we'll talk about how you can make some adjustments to that program to make it work the way you want. And then I will give you some assembly tips. Um, so when you're putting this robot together, there are some things um, that might seem like they're, they're relatively small um, changes or differences in how it can be put together, but it can actually make a big change, a big impact on how well the robot performs. So I will um, give you some tips for how to put this robot together so it works the best, okay? So that's what we will be working on today. Any questions before we get started? All right. So. Let's start with a review of motors. So we said that a basic motor um, includes an axle that's supposed to turn in the middle, and then it has this bar of metal that's attached to that axle, and it's got a wire wrapped around this bar. And then this, this wire allows electricity to flow around this bar. And when you have electricity flowing around in a coil, what does that create? What's that? Electric yeah, an electric field. And also another type of field. Magnetic field, exactly. So when you have electricity flowing around in a coil like this, you're creating an electromagnet. So that magnet has two poles like all magnets do. It's got a north pole and a south pole. And the direction of the flow of the electricity 
determines where the poles will be. So if the electricity flows in one direction, you get a north pole on top and a south pole on the bottom. And if you reverse the flow of electricity, you reverse the place of the poles. So the south would be on top and the north would be on bottom. So with an electromagnet, you can turn it on and off and you can change the position of those poles. So anyway, we have this electromagnet that's attached to the axle in the middle. And then you've got permanent magnets around the outside of the motor mounted on the frame. And remember, permanent magnets are just what they sound like. They are permanently on, and they're permanently oriented. So the south pole is always on the top of this magnet. The north pole is always on the bottom. Um, and that, that does not change. So what happens is that when the electricity is flowing this way, the north poles um, repel each other and the south poles repel each other and that causes the electromagnet in the middle of this um, motor and also the axle to start turning. So it, it turns the axle in this direction, which is what we want. Um, then a little while later, the motor will have turned around so that it's like this. So then the north pole will be down here, the south pole will be up here. And now the south pole will be attracted to this north pole there. And um, vice versa, down here the north pole will be attracted to the south pole. So the motor keeps on um, turning around that way, but um, there's going to be an issue because um, the pretty soon uh, this north pole is going to be right next to the south pole. The south pole will be next to the north pole, and the magnet would get stuck, right? So what can we do to avoid having our, our motor get stuck in that position? One more magnet. A, a, more magnets? Turn it off. Yeah, yeah, we can turn this, turn this off. So if, that, if we turn the uh, electromagnet off, then... Um, then it wouldn't get stuck, but it also wouldn't really have any force to keep it rotating. So, yeah. Change the polarity? Exactly. So once this, um, once the magnet rotates slightly past the vertical position, we can change the polarity. So now you end up kind of back where you started um, so that now your electromagnet is like this and, and since we've switched the polarity, now we have a north pole up here and a south pole down there. And the magnetic fields are pushing each other away again. And the motor keeps on turning. Okay, so by switching the direction of the electricity flow in this electromagnet, um, we allow this, this motor to keep on turning like that. So that's the, um, that's the basics of an electric motor. So any questions about that? Okay. And then um, this, this is just a plain electric motor, but we also talked about a special type of electric motor called a servo motor, which is basically a, a plain motor like this plus a little electronic brain. So that that little electronic brain is responsible for controlling the speed and the direction of this motor. So that little brain has little switches that it can turn on and off to send electricity to this, um, this motor and make it turn. So um, the way that we work with servo motors is that we send messages to this little electronic brain and then the brain takes care of the, the low level work of actually um, turning the switches on and off to, to um, make this motor spin. And also um, the little electronic brain 
um, specifies how much power this is getting, so uh, it determines the speed of the motor there as well. Okay, so yes. So, oh, I see. So, so like, why doesn't this thing just stick straight up and down? Oh, uh, yeah. So, it does have a little bit of momentum. So, um, so the momentum is enough to carry it past the, the perfect vertical. And then as soon as it gets, so I think basically um, when, when this gets really close to the vertical, um, we turn off the power slightly, you know, just for a, a millisecond so it doesn't stick. And then when it gets past there a little bit, um, that's when the, uh, the current goes back on and keeps on pushing the motor around in that direction. Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, it's uh, the magnetic wind, we put it like, uh, in a way, it goes like the north side, it goes south and the south. The side is goes to the south just a little bit, uh, and with a little bit angle, yeah. So when, when, I'm sorry. So when you when you turn on the electricity, the the north goes to the the south, and the south goes. In. To the north. Yeah. If so, if if we left the electricity on like this, the the magnet would would end up um, perfectly perfectly vertical. So if we, if we left the electricity on in the same orientation, the, the magnet, now my, my picture isn't perfectly vertical, but uh, the, the magnet would end up straight up and down and the, um, and it would be stuck um, right next to the permanent magnets. So if we left the electricity on, it would be uh, stuck like that. Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, the second question is this, that if we put it the magnet, like in the normal, in a normal situation, uh -huh. uh, the north should be goes to the south of the earth, and the and the south should be goes to the north north of the earth. Every time it's stay on that side, yeah? Right. So if we had a um, magnet that was free to rotate, like in a yeah. compass, yeah, then then the south pole of the magnet would point towards the north pole of the earth. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But right now it's like when we uh, put it on normal and free to rotate, it goes to north and this kind goes to south. I mean, why is stay on like south to the south side of the earth and north to the north of the face? Oh, oh, why second, doesn't it? The second situation that you see. I I see. So so why why doesn't this south pole just get attracted to the north pole of the earth instead of instead of up here? Yeah. Um, well, okay, because the earth has a magnetic field, but it's very very weak, mm -hmm. um, and these magnets are much much stronger than the the earth's magnetic field. So um, this magnet might feel some pull from the Earth, but it's just going to be a little, little tiny, tiny bit. Uh, whereas these, the pull from these magnets are going to be much, much stronger. So, so these are going to greatly overwhelm the force from the Earth. OK? Yeah. Uh, other questions? OK. All right. Um, so we said that. Uh, we need to send commands to our servo motors to make the servo motors do what we want. So the commands that we send to these servo motors that the little brains receive are voltage pulses. So if we looked at the voltage over time, When we send these little pulses, the voltage would start at, at zero volts, and then there would be a pulse that would go up to five volts. 
and that pulse would last for a short length of time, then it would come back down, and then a while later, there would be another pulse. And we said that the information that we're sending is actually contained in the length of time that this pulse lasts. And we call that the pulse width because when we look at it on a graph, it's the, the width of this spike. So the pulse width is what matters. We said that there is 20 milliseconds between these pulses, and that doesn't really change. Um, that doesn't send any information to the motor. That's just when the motor expects the next pulse. And if it waits much longer than 20 milliseconds and it doesn't get a pulse, it's just going to say, OK, I'm done with my job. I'm going to uh, stop moving. But as long as it keeps getting those pulses every 20 milliseconds, it will keep listening uh, to the information and keep doing what they say. So um, we used a command to send those pulses. So we used this command that was pulse out. Um, so we said things like pulse out 500, and that command told the motor to um, spin full speed, yeah, clockwise. And if we said pulse out um, 1,000, that was, what was that? Right, full speed counterclockwise. And so we could send a command that was pulse out 750. And, and what did that Stop. represent? Stop. Stop, exactly. That's halfway between full speed that direction, full speed that direction. So that's, that's stopped right in the middle. And then if we send out commands that are close to this, like um, 760, say, that would be um, moving in this direction, but close to stop. So that would be slow. So that would be slow counterclockwise. And um, if we go the other way, between 750 and 500, that would be slow clockwise. OK? So, um, so we're, we're varying this, this pulse width um, by using these commands. So um, slower or, or smaller numbers represent uh, narrower pulse width, and bigger numbers represent wider pulse width. Okay? So that's how we send messages to our little robot brain. We have to send a pulse to tell it which direction and how fast to turn. And we have to keep sending those pulses as long as we want that motor to keep turning. So if we want to send, um, say, 100 pulses, do we, oh, oh, before we go on, I, I just wanted to clarify one thing about the um, pulse width command. So the, the command is something like pulse out and then you would say like 12, for instance, and then 500. So this almost looks like pulse out 12,500. But, but it's actually two separate things. So this right here is the pin number that you're using. So this is telling the, the microcontroller that we're using pin 12. We want to send these pulses out on pin 12. We're creating voltage pulses on pin 12. Okay? And then the, the last number here is the duration. 
how long the pulse lasts. So, so there's actually two separate things that we're telling the, uh, the, the robot here. Okay? All right, so any questions about that command? All right, then um, if we are, if we want the motor to keep turning, we have to keep sending these commands over and over again. Um, and so we could just type out, you know, pulse out 12500, pulse out 12500, pulse out 12500, over and over and over again to keep sending these commands. But if we want to do that, you know, send 100 of these pulses, that would take up a lot of lines of our program, and that would be really tedious to type it all in. So rather than doing, you know, just typing the thing over and over and over again, is there another way that we can send um, a certain number of these pulses? Yeah. Yeah, what can we do? Use counter. Yep, so we can use a, a counter variable, and we can use that in a part of a loop, right? Yeah, so a, a do loop would just continue on and on and on forever. So if we wanted our motor to run um, continuously forever, we could put this command inside of a do loop, and, and it would just repeat and keep on going um, as long as the robot was powered up. But what if we wanted it to run, say, um, say 30 times? Is there another type of loop we could use? Well, the counter is, is part of that loop, but um, that, that loop has a specific, a specific name. It starts with a, a particular word. That's a for loop, okay? So it, it starts with the word for, and it, um, it goes, like, for, counter equals 1 to 20, or, you know, 50, say. And then we have some code here in the middle that we want to send over and over again. And then at the end, we would write next. So this is called a for loop, or a for next loop. And and this is how we make the program do something a certain number of times. So uh, more than once and um, less than forever. It's, it's a specific number of times, OK? So when we did our lab last time, we used this for next loop to control how long the motor turned in each direction. Remember, we had a windshield wiper that was going back and forth, and we wanted it to go only half a turn in each direction, not more and not less. So, um, so we can use a for loop to do that. Um, so the longer we want the loop to run, the bigger we make this number, and the shorter we want the loop uh, to run, the, the smaller this number has to be. Okay? So here's a question. If we get a pulse every 20 milliseconds, um, how long will this loop run if uh, we run it 50 times? So how much time would that actually take? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, the, so if our, our time per iteration is, is 20 milliseconds and we have 50 of them, um, when we multiply those together, 20 milliseconds is actually 0.02 seconds, and we're multiplying that by 50. So if we multiply those two together, um, what we end up with is, yeah, um, we get one second. So, 
So when you have this counter running for 50 iterations, that lasts about one second. So if we wanted this to run for two seconds, how many iterations would that be? 100, 100 exactly. So, um, so that's, this, this for loop is really specifying how much time we want that motor to run. Okay? Yeah? Did the point of two come from the 20 milliseconds? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'll go into conversions a little bit later in the semester, but, but um, milli stands for thousandth. So this is 20 thousandths of a second, which is 0 0.02 seconds. Five hundred. Is there five hundred pulses? Or no, no. Okay. So, so this is the duration of the the pulse itself. What's the unit? Of yeah. So this is a weird unit. So um, this is uh, CPU or, or processor clock cycles. Um, so, so five hundred of those equals one millisecond. So. So a, a duration of a pulse out command of 500 equals one millisecond. Okay. Um, so so technically there could be some small variation in the the duration of each of these um, cycles, each of these um, four next um, iterations. There could be a small change, but it. It's mostly going to be the 20 milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, other questions? All right. So, anyway, so um, we use this for next command to tell the motor how long to run, and we use the pulse out command to tell the motor how fast to run and in which direction. And we'll be using those today because we'll be um, making a robot and we need to tell the wheels how long to turn, and how fast to turn, and which direction to turn, okay? So we'll be using these same commands to make our, our robots roll along on the floor. So are there any questions about these commands before we go on? All right. <clears throat> then let's talk about the the track and the, the goal for today. So the idea is that our robot is a robot inside of a, a warehouse and it's supposed to drive around and navigate through this warehouse and then um, stop along the way to let other things go past, and then um, get through the whole course and back itself up and, and park itself at the end of its job in a little parking spot. So that's, that's the idea. The track that it's going to navigate looks kind of like this. We start off at a starting line, and then we go forward, and there's a, a place to pause. This is where maybe another um, track would go by and other robots could go past. So we have to wait there to make sure nobody is going and we're not going to run into anybody. And we go on. And then there's a bit of a turn. We go this way. And then the last part of the course is like this. And there's a parking spot at the end. So this is the path that our robot is supposed to follow through the warehouse. So what we want to do is we want to start here at the starting line. We want to drive forward, come to this, um, this other second spot. We're going to wait here, make sure that uh, nobody else is going and we're not going to crash into anybody. So we're going to pause for three seconds there. And we're going to drive forward to here, turn, drive up this way, turn that way, get here. And then at this last part, we're actually going to turn left and back ourselves into the parking spot 
so that we're ready to leave again um, at some later time, okay? But for today, we just want to get into that parking spot and park ourselves there, and that's going to be the end of the course for today, okay? So that's the goal. So as you can see, this track is broken up into segments, and we call these each segment a leg. So this is leg one, leg two, leg three, leg four, and then um, this would be leg five, the reverse. And then this is the parking spot at the end. Um, so, so that is what we want our robot to do. So are there any questions about our goal for today? Okay, then um, let's go on and do a preview of the actual lab. So, so this is the lab for today. As you can see, it shows the course that the robot is going to follow. Um, and basically, it is just asking you to, um, to program your robot to do this. So let's see how we can actually program our robots. So like I said, we're not going to make you start this from scratch. Um, we're going to um, give you a program that's a starting point. So. We're going to go here to Instructor Files, and then under ET302, and then uh, Warehouse. And it's this Warehouse New that you want. Warehouse New. Yep. Wait, Warehouse. LO3? Um, it's under ET, yeah, 302, LO3, Warehouse. Okay. So, so let's take a look and see uh, what we actually have here. So this program um, has some comments, which are good. So we have some, we're creating some variables at the beginning. And then uh, we have the first leg routine, and then pause and beep, that's good. And then the second leg routine, um, and then a left turn, which is good. Third leg and right turn. Um, but then, there's no, there's no fourth leg in here, okay? So um, the, the fourth leg is actually missing. So that's no good. So we're going to have to add in a fourth leg. Um, and also, when the robot, when you run this program, you'll see that uh, this robot is not going to behave perfectly. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to start here at the beginning and it's going to drive forward and stop, but it's not going to stop right on that line. It's going to stop maybe, um, you know, six inches uh, ahead of the line or something. And then it's going to come to this turn, and it's going to um, turn itself, but it's not going to turn the right amount. So um, it might turn a little bit too much, and then it might uh, end up over here off the track. So, so we've got the basic sections of the code there, but none of those sections is going to work perfectly. You're going to have to probably adjust each one, okay? So, um, so let's talk about how we can actually make these adjustments. So if we are looking at this first leg here, um, and we saw we, we run the program and the robot goes a little bit too far, how could we adjust this this first leg section to make the robot go not quite as far. Yeah. That's right. So, so we could change this. If this is going a little bit too far when we are doing 150, maybe we could make it, you know, 120 instead. And that would go um, a little bit shorter distance, okay? Because we're, remember this, this number up here determines how long, how much time that motor runs. So if we make that number smaller, 
the motor runs for less time and the car will go less distance, okay? So, um, so we could change that around. And then the same thing for the turn. So if the robot is turning too much, we could make this number smaller. If it's turning not enough, mm. we could make the number bigger. So, um, so you, can, you can change these numbers around to, to make the motor um, go farther or not as far. There, now there's something else I want to point out here. So this is a routine that says um, we're going forward. So when we, when we drive forward, of course, we want both of the motors to turn forward, right? But if we look at the code, we see that we're sending a pulse out of 500 to one motor and 1,000 to another motor. So, so that means that one motor is rotating clockwise and the other is rotating counterclockwise, right? So it seems like that would make the, um, the robot turn around in circles. But actually, if we run this code, we find that it actually makes the motor, the robot drive straight ahead like it says. So can anybody figure out or, or guess why that might be? Why you would have to make one motor turn clockwise and the other turn clock, counterclockwise for them both to roll forward? Why would we do that? They're, they're open. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So, so one of them is on the, the right side of the robot and the other is on the left side. And so they're, they're actually flipped over. So, so one motor is like this and the other one is flipped over with the axle pointing out like this. And so because they're flipped over, we have to make one of them turn clockwise and the other one turn counterclockwise in order for them both to rotate forward relative to the car. Okay, so this is, this is a really weird thing, but that's what we need. When, we're, when we want the car to drive straight ahead, one of the motors has to turn clockwise and the other has to turn counterclockwise, okay? So that's, that's just a weird thing to be aware of. So you do have to mess with those numbers if to make it work? No, no. Um, you, can leave, you can leave one of them 500 and the other 1,000 and that will make the car drive forward. Okay. Yeah, so it, it seems like it should make them turn in a circle, but Actually, it makes them both turn forward. Yeah. If you make them both bigger, like by like in the same ratio, will it just make it faster? Well, five hundred and a thousand are the fastest that you can go. So, um, if you make them both closer to seven fifty, it'll make them both go slower. So, if you if you move them both the same distance closer to 750, it you can make things go slower, but you can't go faster than 500 and 1,000. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So. So that's what you're going to have to do for the program. But before we can. Uh, actually run the program, we need to build our robot. So um, if um, so if we go to um, let's see Um, let's see. Um, okay. Ah, uh, let's see. So there. There should be a um, a file that that explains how to assemble the uh, the robot here. Let me see where it is. Yep. 
You know what? Um, we're for assembly instructions, we can um, search for uh, Bobot assembly. Um, and um, this will this will show you how to um, put the robot together. Okay? So um, we can we can um, follow these directions to put the robot together. But there are a couple of tips that I want to give you um, that will really help to um, make this robot work properly. Okay. So the first thing is about um, how we put the uh, the motors into the chassis. Okay. So um, so actually, we can turn off the projector here for a minute. So if we look at the chassis from the side, it looks kind of like this. We got um, the back part where the wheel goes. And then um, the chassis goes out, out like this. And then in the front, we have this little rectangle where we attach the servo motor. And this servo motor has the little, um, the little axle sticking out of it, and there, it's off center. So what we want to do is we want to put the servo motor axle right there so that it's closer to the middle of the chassis. This is what we want, okay? It's physically possible to assemble it in a different way. It's, it's possible to assemble it so that um, the axle of the motor is closer to the end. This is wrong. We do not want to do this, okay? This seems like a really subtle difference. It seems like something so small couldn't make much of a change, but actually, it, it can be the difference between something that works pretty smoothly and something that's just really frustrating and takes forever and is just um, soul crushing, basically. <laughs> and the reason is because when we put the, um, there, there's a battery underneath here, and when we put the um, axle near the center of the chassis, the, the weight of the battery and most of the weight of the um, most of the weight of the whole robot ends up on this axle and on the wheel. This that is rotating and, and contacting ground. And so what happens here is that when the motor has most of the weight on the wheel there, that wheel tends to roll more consistently. It does not slip. Um, and so it, it just it works the same way every time. So if you if you put in a program and you run the same program ten times, it's going to do the same thing every time, and that's exactly what you want. The problem over here is if you you put the um, the axle in the the other place over here, then more of the weight is on this caster, and so this wheel back here will tend to slip when the program is running. What that means is that you can run the same program 10 times and it goes 10 different places. Okay? Imagine trying to get your robot to run down this track and, and you're running the same program and it goes a different place every time. If it's not, if it does that, it's just there's no way to adjust the program and you could end up spending a long time here and just banging your head and it's just really frustrating. Okay? So, so this difference, which seems really subtle, is actually really important. All right. So put the motor towards the center of the chassis. Um, so that's the first tip. The second tip is that um, 
this chassis has a little hole in the center of it, and the instructions will tell you to um, put the, the wire, this battery wire, through that hole, okay? Don't do that. What you want to do is you want to put this battery, you're going to Velcro it in. We don't have to um, screw it in. You're just going to Velcro it in and then take the wire and wrap it around the side, okay? Just wrap it around the side. It's going to hang out the back and that's totally fine. Um, just wrap it around the side. That, the reason for that is because if you shove this wire through the, the center, you can do that um, when this is the, the only wire in. So people do that first, they put the wire up through there and it's neat and tidy and it looks nice. And then they put the two wires from the servo motors in there. And then at the end of the day, they come to try and um, pull the battery off um, so they can recharge it. it. Turns out it won't fit anymore because you've got these two extra servo wires in there. So then you can't get this thing out, you can't recharge your battery, and you have to take apart your whole, um, your whole cart to, to get the battery off, okay? So don't put the battery wire through the middle. Just put it around the side and, and plug it in to your um, Bobot that way. That way when you're done, at the end of the day, you just pull this battery off and recharge it, and it's no big deal, okay? So that is the second um, assembly tip. Oh yeah, and then um, the the little caster wheel here should be the back of your robot, and these big wheels should be the front. So it should be rolling along like this. Now sometimes you build the robot and you get it all put together and you run the program, and it turns out it starts driving backwards like this. Okay, um, if that's if that happens to you, it's no big deal. All you do is you, you swap around the position of these two um, motor connectors. So you take the one that was in pin 12 and you put it in 13, and you take the one from 13 and put it in 12, and then you run the same program and it drives forward, okay? So if you get your car and it starts driving backwards, just swap those positions of those two um, motor cables and you should be fine. Okay, um, and that's, yeah. And these are the same motor cables, or they're red, white, and black? Yes, yeah, and yeah, that's a good point. When you plug those in, make sure that they are in the correct orientation. So the black is towards the middle of the board, um, the white is towards the edge, okay? Um, otherwise, they just won't turn on. So that's all that I had for the uh, assembly tips. Do you have... Any questions about that? No, sir. Yeah. Just with the program, uh, you said we're missing um, that part where we're going on leg four. Yeah. So we have to do yep. that and then plug in the numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think there's actually the second turn is missing and also leg four. Um, leg, I believe. So that would be leg two. Uh, or. Um, no, okay, so it's, so, hold on, so we've got, we got the track like this, so um, this is one, two, three, four, and then five. So, so you need to add in this leg and also this turn right there. You have to put both of those. And remember, for this turn, we want the robot to turn left so that it backs up into the parking spot, okay? Yeah. So, yeah, other questions? Yeah. In the, on the paper, it says left turn one and forward third leg are two different things. Yes. So we keep it as that? Yeah, or? I would. Because 
Um, yeah, we, so left turn one is here, and then forward third leg is here. So they're, they're two separate operations. Yep. All right, yeah, other questions? Okay, the last thing I would say is just have fun. Um, this, is, this is a pretty cool experiment. You get to program your own autonomous robot to navigate around. So yeah, enjoy it. And you know, when you're done and, and it works, take a video and show your friends. It's a cool thing, all right? You should be proud of it. All right, so then I will take attendance and I'll let you go.